Hello everyone, welcome to chapter two for the tidy modeling with our book club. Uh, today's chapter is a tidyverse primer. Um, for those of us who've been used to the tidyverse, this is a lot of this is probably going to be review, but I think it's important to see or think about why things are set up the way they are. And then it sort of will transition into how tidy models fits into the world of uh, this type of programming syntax. Uh, so I'm essentially running off of the pre-existing uh, notes because it's pretty thorough since we're cohort three like enough people seem to have like gone through this that like it's there, there isn't really that much more I can add like the only things I can think of adding will essentially derail this conversation but we can talk about it um, so uh, we're going to first talk about the tidyverse design principles thinking about what it means to be human centric for design um, why tidyverse sort of behaves and uses existing data structures instead of creating their own and then how we can actually use it in our day-to-day -day programming so the main thing about tidyverse design principles is it's very it's human centric but it's focused on the actual user um, so you as the user get a lot of syntax benefits for coding uh, sort of the problem with that is if you want to end up writing tools that meet the tidyverse requirements it puts a lot of engineering problems on the person creating the tool in the effort to make it easier for people to use it um, but from the user's point of view things are super consistent so we usually the functions are named after verbs and the verbs usually pertain to what the action that they're doing. Uh, if you know a little bit about working with databases in SQL, especially in dplyr, the verbs are very consistent with the actual SQL um, syntax or markup or whatever SQL you call that, the querying language, there we go. Um, it's composable, so you can, these functions are broken down into only doing one thing and one thing only, and the idea is because the outputs are consistent with all of its other tidyverse functions, if you have a function that does one thing, you can do that one thing and pass it on to another function, so you don't have these mega functions that do a bunch of things at the same time, you essentially compose smaller functions together. And there's this notion of this being inclusive. I do find it easier to get people into R, um, but then once you end up hitting certain topics in programming, um, people, you sort of like, <laughs> I personally find this sort of as the problem of like, you can teach using Tidyverse and it's great to get people introduced um, up until the point where you need to teach about functions and then things get really, really difficult to teach. Um, so, but if you are not creating functions and you're trying to use existing functions, it does make everything much easier. And our studio and the folks there that use Tidyverse have built a pretty good inclusive community around learning. So what does it mean to be uh, designed for humans? Um, so this is, uh, if you haven't seen this, this is uh, one of those things about, um, it talks about a Norman door uh, essentially, if you've ever gone to a door and you couldn't tell right away if this is a push door or a pull door, if you've ever ran into a door, um, it's essentially saying that it's not really your fault, it is the designer's fault because the door did not make it obvious on how you need to interact with it. So, for example, a door that requires you to push doesn't really need a handlebar. If it was just a flat metal plate, it's obvious to you that the only way to interact with this door is pushing it. Um, so that is uh, an example of fixing a Norman door. But it's all around thinking about, hey, if I don't know anything about the tool I'm looking at, so a function in tidyverse would be like select, what would be a good guess about what select would be doing? Um, and some people might say you're selecting columns or rows. Um, 
either of those would work. Uh, you are doing something by selecting something out of the data set that you're working with. So this idea of trying to name things and having the behavior be consistent with what people, most people will expect is sort of the design principle for, hopefully, I have no idea what's what's going on outside, if that's a plane or a, hopefully it's not too loud. Um, and so this design principle of, you know, making sure that your function will be self-explanatory if someone's never seen the tool is sort of the idea behind the tidyverse. And so we see this in the actual tidyverse. So like we've seen the uh, MT cars data set uh, pretty often. And let's say you're presented with this function called arrange. Uh, if you know a little bit about SQL, this will help you a lot uh, translating all of this stuff over. But um, arranging usually typically signifies some kind of ordering or placing things in a particular order. Usually if you work with data, arranging data usually means sorting by some kind of column. So the verbs or function names that are being used typically highlight the the task that is trying to do right so like most of especially in dplyr most of the things that you're using are these verbs because verbs do things and the thing that you do things on is the actual data frame or the data set that's being passed along and so you see the same thing like pivot like tidy r rename their functions to pivot longer and pivot wider. And that's because the older names of gather and spread were kind of confusing. Uh, one, it was confusing to use for the, the actual way you use the syntax. And then it was also confusing to remember what you, uh, which function does which, um, unless you actually know the mnemonic of like gathering is like, you can take your hands and wrap your arm around something to gather something and it will make something wide to long and then spreading something out is like throwing it across your floor and then it makes something from long to wide. So that's like the actual thought process of why they were named they were the, the way they were, but it wasn't explicit enough. And it turns out that people just understand the verb pivot uh, from Excel world, like making pivot tables. And so it's important to keep in mind, you need to meet people where they are like, okay, if the world runs on Excel and everyone knows what a pivot table is, uh, you sort of have to like cater to, to those like terminology in such a way, instead of trying to reinvent uh, your own verbs or your own way. Um, Cause that's usually the pain point for adoption is if you know that this is the absolute best way to do something, but it takes this huge activation energy to get people onboarded, it's never really gonna get widely adopted. And so that is the same reason why in tidyverse, they reuse existing data structures. So data frames are the data structure that if you are learning how to program in R, this is one of the core fundamental data structures in R. It's fundamental enough that you don't even need to load up a library to have a data frame object. Unlike other programming languages, typically the data frame object doesn't natively exist. And so this makes R unique in that the data frame object, which stores tabular data, is you know, part of the R language, core language. And so it's also important that you don't try to make something that's too different from the actual data frame object. Um, it's very common to sort of, hey, we have this whole paradigm shift in how we want to think about our data set that also involves, you know, changing the fundamental data structure. And now you have to learn about what this fundamental data structure is for you to be able to use uh, the tool. And then that, that means that learning your tool has another barrier of entry because it's some data structure that isn't natively supported. And so, and then that also means that if it, it's harder to take your tool and then up make it more general and work with the rest of the language if it's the super specific data structure that you create. So instead of creating a brand new data structure, the tidyverse world created a superset 
of the data frame object, which is known as a tibble. The main benefit of a tibble, um, aside from you can treat a tibble like a regular data frame, but it adds more features to it. So there are a few things that a tibble does. Um, one of them and the most important thing is this notion of a list column uh, where you can store essentially a list as a cell in your data frame. And this allows it so you can keep your data in this rectangular structure as much as possible. And if you have these weird like JSON list things or these metadata things, you can throw them all into a single cell. And then the other columns would essentially be like the metadata for that cell. And then you can use that cell um, as a way to hold multiple bits of information, and then you don't have to actually have it um, spread out or read out um, for the entire row. So it's a good way to bunch a bunch of things into one cell and then use the rest of the data frame structure to provide metadata. And this also keeps all of your information in column form. So all of each, it follows the uh, tidy data model of each row contains an observation, each column contains a variable. So now, for example, this variable here contains splits. So we have multiple splits in our data if we are trying to bootstrap or sample our data set. And so because this keeps everything in a data frame format, we, can, we know how to work with data frames. And then also with other tools, we know how to work with columns in a data frame programmatically. The other thing that the tidyverse does is it's designed for like this piping operator, uh, which essentially says, uh, take the thing that I'm giving you on the left and put it in as the first argument for to the function on the right. So that's what the piping operator is doing. This concept of piping parameters is not new. Um, you know, it's a core feature of how bash runs. Um, there are single functions that do one thing and one thing only. And then you take the output and you pipe it into the next function that can only do one thing and one thing only. The main takeaway about pipes is you need to make sure that your outputs are consistent. And that means that you have to be mindful of what is the actual data object you're operating on. So in Bash, most of the time, the thing that you're operating on is some kind of stream of text. But in R, the thing that we're mostly going to be operating on is a data frame object. So that's why in the tidyverse, all, most, if not all of the functions have the data frame as the first object in, and then the return thing from the, um, the return object from the function is now also a data frame. And that allows you to pipe objects pipe output into the next input and so on. The nice, the other nice thing about piping, um, if you're a mathematician, this probably isn't too much of a problem, uh, but it allows you to rewrite code such that you don't have to read it from inside out. You can literally scan your eyes down a column and then see all of the verbs and get a general idea of what's going on. So instead of looking through this line of code, looking for the innermost function, which is arrange, um, and then say, okay, the first thing you do is arrange, and now you have to backtrack out, and then seeing slice, you can read down a column and say, okay, we took cars, we arranged something, and then we're slicing this other thing. And then if you know what the verbs are doing, you can get a general sense of what's going on in your code. And then if you want to get something more specific, you can look to the right and then see what's actually going on. And so in the tidyverse, because tidyverse code is mainly concerned with manipulating data and the core data structure is a data frame, the thing that's being piped around between tidyverse objects is a data frame object. Uh, and this ties into tidy models because the thing that you're going to be moving around is some kind of model object um, that you're moving around. So uh, 
it's not exactly going to be a data or a tibble, um, even though when you print it, it will look like a tibble. But the thing that you're moving around is some kind of information that contains a data frame, but also it's really the things containing all of the information needed to fit and work with models. And so what this allows you to do, uh, because the inputs and outputs are sort of somewhat standardized, um, it fits into R's functional programming model, which is in general a pretty good practice. And essentially what functional programming is, is everything that is done is done as a function. And all of the inputs to the function are sort of set. And once you know the inputs to the function, you will get a output that you can essentially calculate. This is different from, you know, what, what programmers call like side effects. So like printing is a side effect, right? Because because I put in the string hello, and I print out the string hello, it doesn't return anything. It does something to the screen, but there's no actual return value. So if you like print hello and you assign that to a variable, you don't really get anything. I don't, I don't think you do. Um, another thing is uh, saving and reading, oh, not reading, but saving uh, files to a CSV. That doesn't really return anything. Um, it, it saves a file to your disk, but it doesn't return a thing that you can like store as a variable, right? So if you say gets, like X gets like read underscore CSV. Um, I actually don't know what you will, will actually get, but it's definitely not like the actual, or maybe they have it set up where you can, where it returns a data frame, but that is known as a side effect. Um, so those things that like do some other calculation that doesn't actually get returned is known as a side effect. And so what's nice about functional programming is because the inputs are known and because the way the tidyverse is set up where if I give you a data frame and these inputs, I get a data frame object back. It's not doing some random calculation to the side. This also makes it much easier to, if there's a problem in one of the functional programming pipeline bits, um, it's much easier to write a reproducible example because you can completely calculate or feed in the inputs that are problematic and then you get the output. Um, so that is the benefit of using functional programming without side effects. Um, it's also kind of um, a good programming practice if you can make it so. Um, but the other nice thing about functional programming is it works with the per library, specifically the map class of functions, which essentially says, here's the thing I want you to work on, and here's a function. And then per, like L apply, S apply, V apply, knows how to iterate through each one of those objects and then run the function that you provided with its inputs. Um, and so that is the benefit of having everything in a data frame format because you can say, hey, I want you to do this one calculation from this function for each value of this row, um, sorry, for each value of this column. And so that's where list columns become really useful because if you know that the structure of that list column is consistent across each of your rows, you can now write a function that can say, I know this is a list column. We know how to handle lists. This is a function that knows how to manipulate lists, but now you can say, do it across all of the values in this one column. And so it prevents you, or it, it means that you don't have to write your standard for loop, uh, which is kind of just more code to write, like here's a for loop. Um, and you can simply write a function. You can test your function in complete isolation. And then you can say, OK, I have this function that works on this simple case if I manually feed in numbers. Now let's uh, take this column that can be passed in row by row into this function. Um, OK, cool. And then on top of map um, in per, uh, there is this function called walk. So you could use map to say, for example, write out a bunch of CSVs. Um, and you're essentially leveraging the fact that it's a bunch of side effects, but that doesn't really return a value. Um, if that's the case, you're 
quote unquote supposed to use the walk function, but most of the time map also works as well because usually what comes back is like either a true false value that like the right has successfully completed. I, I actually don't know the act actual case for this, but we can check afterwards. But uh, it doesn't throw an error just because you know CSV is writing something as a side effect that doesn't say it doesn't throw an error. So you could potentially still use map, but the um, if you know the thing that you're like using is nothing but a side effect, like writing CSVs or printing to the screen, you essentially use walk instead of map. And then this goes back into the differences between tibbles and data frames. Um, one of those big differences is that it allows for list columns. And so that sort of made a lot of things easier because it it's still a data frame object. So old tools and old things that don't work in tidyverse can still work on this tibble object. You just don't have the ability to parse out the list column which is fine, uh, but you're at the, the end of the day, you're still working with a data frame and most people in R know how to work with a data frame object. Uh, but because it is a superset of features, um, there are things that Tibbles do um, that are good. Uh, one of those being that Tibbles, um, Tibbles can work with a broader variety of column names, which is you know somewhat useful. Um, but the the actual thing that I I really like about tibbles is it actually does prevent uh, partial matching of arguments. So if you didn't know about this, R is really scary in the sense that if you have parameters or variable names that are spelled very similarly in the beginning and you only specify part of that spelling, uh, things get weird. Um, or if you like, it's really common if you have like a typo. So, uh, so this is something that Tibbles will prevent you from doing. So if you have like partial as a data, uh, as a column, you can't say DF part. Um, sorry, you can say DF part in a regular data frame, but it will not allow you to say Tibble part from a Tibble. Um, probably, this is probably something that you're not using as your day to day. I hope you're not using this as like the feature to, to, to run some kind of like, uh, critical part of your, your code, but it is something that can happen and it will catch you if you like make a typo or like, um, you name the column maximum, but then you put max and then like things work until they don't work. Right. So, uh, that is one thing that tibbles are preventing you from doing. The other thing um, that Tibbles do, and this goes into the mindset of keeping your, your outputs consistent. If we select a column from a data frame, what comes back is always going to be a data frame object, regardless of if we select one column or multiple columns. And so that's the thing that Tibbles give us is that if you do have a Tibble and you select a single column, it will always return you a data frame object. And that makes it much easier for you as the programmer to work with, because now you don't have to make a check for if this is a data frame, do this. If it's a not a data frame, turn it into a data frame, because that probably means someone passed in a single uh, column of data. Um, in the old ways, you would always have to say DF uh, column and then another parameter like comma drop equals false, right? If you wanted that feature. Um, if you're programming with it. Uh, but this sort of just sets that up for you so you don't have to say drop equals false. And then the last thing that Tibbles allow us that is the most beneficial or makes working with building more tools on top of easier is this idea of list columns. Uh, because we can store, if we know the schematic or how that list is going to be structured, we can throw that all into a, um, a cell in our row, and then we can move on with our data set. And then we can use the per set of functions to parse out any bits of the uh, list column that we need. And so this is one example of using tidyverse. Um, if you have a data set, it does make it much easier to simply read down the 
column and say, okay, we have some, some data frame that we're calling all stations. The first thing that we're doing is read CSV, reading a CSV. Then we're selecting some columns. We're making some set of changes. Um, we're going to prepare to do some kind of group calculate uh, calculation. Uh, we're summarizing based off of each group. And then we can say, oh, we're looking at the max of some value, right? And it helps you orient if you're new to a code base much easier and um, it makes it a little bit harder to debug sometimes uh, because typically what I end up doing is like most of these things will end up being like a single step and then once the whole thing works I'll rewrite it so it's in this one little pipeline um, the thing that I guess I should have our studio up uh, the thing that is super useful um, that I found if you're uh, quickly prototyping uh, code. Um, load up dplyr. Um, if you have something like mt cars and you're piping into select, I don't know, I think it's like mpg. Yeah. And then you're doing filter mpg greater than 15, let's say, right? Um, when you're prototyping code, it does get annoying, like you commenting out the last bit. So sort of the trick is if you sort of pipe out this bracket dot bracket, which essentially just says like, just return the thing itself. Uh, this does help you when you, when you're like trying to like figure out like, oh, what does it look like if I comment that out? Um, you don't have to comment out the, the little pipe operator at the end. Um, that's sort of, and you can do the same thing similar with ggplot too, which is in ggplot, you say like plus null, I think that will return the actual end of the figure. So it helps with um, that little bit. That's a great tip. Yeah. Uh, yeah. That's super helpful when you're just like, what the heck is going on? And I hate like commenting out like the pre, the, the, the little pipe at the, the line before. Yeah, and, and if you are like using version control, it at, will actually diff one line instead of two lines. So like, there's nice things with that. Hey, sorry, I got a question. Uh, mm -hmm. um, when you uh, specify the package name in the function, like deploy r select, do you have oh, to do the same yeah. thing for pipe? Because I, I believe that's part of the package, right? Um, so yes, most of tidyverse will so the pipe operator comes from the library Magritter. Um, so like library, I think that's how you spell it. No, that's not how you spell it. Yeah, that's how you spell it. So the pipe operator actually comes from this library and most of the tidyverse functions will export the pipe. Um, there are times and scenarios. Um, so let's say for example, I let me reset my R session. I think if, for example, I library just per, and I say empty cars, I don't know, summary, that's a function that works. Oh, I guess it does work. Um, there are, there might be some functions that don't export the McGritter pipe. Um, and I run into this occasionally because the way I have my script set up is as soon as I've done doing some kind of long computation, I always write out my results and then I have a brand new script to read in that result. So I don't have to redo computation if I'm trying to iterate over something. And then if the second thing is like, you know, not using any tidyverse libraries, but i still want to use the pipe. Um, yeah, you would still have to load up the McGritter package. Um, the other thing about this notation um, this dot dot notation is I, if, if you look at like my code these days, like I've gotten to the habit of always putting this in to the point where like, sometimes I even forgot the library, the function, and I just use it directly. Um, that's not a good thing. But um, if you're learning um, tidyverse and especially, I think that if you're learning a new library for the first time, especially if that's a library that loads up a bunch of li other libraries under the hood for you. Um, it's, I think I find like, not if you're brand new to this for the, like if you're brand new to R for the first time, load up tidyverse and don't worry about where the things are coming from. They just are all part of tidyverse. Um, it, but if you want to learn a little bit more about like what 
where these functions are coming from, I personally find this dot dot notation to be really explicit of like, this is the actual package that this function is coming from. Um, trying to do that in your code is super useful when you're trying to learn what, what is going on in this new package that you're uh, trying to work with. Um, again, not really something that I would suggest if you're brand, brand new to R, but it is something that I suggest if you're learning a new like way or a new set of packages. Uh, for me, this happened a lot when I was working with geospatial data, because if you've ever seen any geospatial code, it's like the first 10 lines are like library calls. And so um, just to figure out like where these functions are coming from um, is really useful. Um, and so the dot dot notation is essentially just saying, hey, I want this actual group by function from dplyr instead of some other function. And uh, when you load up tidyverse, you'll see a notice about masks happening. Um, I think it should. Yeah, so you'll see that like, hey, uh, dplyr filter actually masks over the stats filter function and dplyr lag masks over the stats lag function. Uh, but if you actually rely on the original stats lag, like the way you would have to specify it is saying stats colon colon. Yeah, just ask because you, oh, go ahead. oh, go ahead, sorry. Um, does it matter if you like you want the stats and you load it before tidyverse? So it's going to use whatever um, loaded last. Loaded last, okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, so that is like a thing that you also, yeah, it is. Yeah, it, it does. It does. It, it essentially loads. So the last thing you load will overwrite whatever you loaded on top. So yeah, if you really do need the stats lag function and you also loaded up tidyverse, it's probably like instead of loading stats at the end, like just use the colon colon because it's really, it's gonna be, if someone just copy paste a bit of code and not realize that like your library orders have a have an actual ordering, um, that's gonna cause a whole set of problems. Um, I, it's one of I the know, things I, I, I do not like. I error with, uh, <laughs> with select. I was using a, a, new, a new package yeah. that conflicted with dplyr select and I, I had no idea what was wrong. It was like, this was working, but now it's not working. And anyway. Yeah. And if you're, if you're writing a new package, like the, the other issue now is like, because this is so, this has essentially become like the data science um, domain specific language in R of manipulating data. Like do not write a function that's called select. Like that is, man, you got some guts trying to do that into your package. Um, and stuff like that. Um, yeah, same with mass, like all of those libraries that like just get loaded automatically with R or come with base R, like this, this ends up being a huge problem with this. And most of this comes from if you try to do statistic simulations because that's where all of these libraries are coming from. Uh, yeah, it becomes a huge pain. Uh, and so I've gotten to the habit partially because I've been using R for a long enough time that like this notation doesn't jar me anymore that like I just use this dot dot notation for almost everything like it's to the point like I've overcorrected to the point where like sometimes I realize that my scripts don't even have the library call at the top and then like I have to go back up and like fix things before I send it to people but um, I pretty much just use the dot dot notation like all the time now and yeah, it helps me um, learn a little bit more about the the functions in tidyverse but yeah um, you can go yeah, sorry. I was asking about the pipe because, uh, like, like you said, like in package development or something like that, it's always nice to specify the actual package that you're using rather than loading the tidyverse. But I never see that for uh, McGregor, right? McGregor pipe. So I was wondering, uh, I don't know if that's. Uh, um. So it does. It does show up. Um. Hold on. Let me. Hold on. Uh, I have way too many. I have like my new keyboard in front of me, but then I have my old one because like it works and I know how to use it. Um, you plier GitHub. So if we look at the description file, uh, yeah, so right here. Uh, so dplyr like imports McGritter, right? So that, that's that's part of like, if you say library dplyr, it will import McGritter. 
uh, and it will import all of this other stuff um, that you probably never know until things go horribly wrong. Um, I did not know it also imports glue, but apparently you can just use glue. Um, even so, if you don't library it, it'll import MedReader? Correct. Even if you don't library it. Touch it. Yeah, okay. it might not attach. And I think the... So can I throw something in? Yeah. Like if you look at the namespace file, um, Is that you should see that dplyr re-exports the ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. pipe. Th there we go. Yeah, so That's dplyr... why you can use it out of the box. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I think I think it's under it's under one of these files. Um, is it under one of these? I think there was a utils pipe. Yeah. Uh, okay. Th this does a whole bunch of other things that we're not going to talk about. <laughs> uh, also, if you didn't know, um, R when it loads up a package will load things up in the order like alphabetical order. That's why you see packages with A, 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 and C, Z, 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 because like sometimes some things have to be loaded in a certain order, like this function called when the function gets loaded, like do these things. <laughs> um, that's just a, a sort of a, a thing. But um, yeah, so dplyr will export the Magritte pipe. Um, I do not, yeah, I, I don't know if dplyr exports like everything. Um, we can test because um, what is the other one? It's like percent star percent. Is that? Creator has other pipe piping operators. Uh, you mean the that's matrix multiplication? Oh, that's the matrix. Oh, that's the matrix multiplication one. Uh, okay. Yeah, I I know dplyr has like other operators. Is it percent dot? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> um, so I think the plier only exports the uh, piping operator instead of the other operators in Magritte. So yeah, there are ways of dealing with that. And my gosh, the trains are busy today. <laughs> um, but yeah, so most of the time in your script, if you library tidyverse, you don't have to worry about this pipe. If you are writing like, an R package, yes, this is something that you have to deal with is um, this percent greater than percent thing. Uh, it becomes even more problematic when you're working with um, tidyverse code in packages because you have to export this dot data pronoun um, from rlang. Otherwise, CRAN is going to yell at you in their CRAN checks. But that is also another problem <laughs> related to packaging. Um, but yeah, so that's that's sort of one of the things that's kind of annoying that I feel is like tidyverse is great when you're teaching when you use it, but the second you try to like write packages and functions around it, like uh, there's a lot of things that like you realize that uh, you are not taught. <laughs> um, and then uh, typically, what I I am going down the road of like I will have to teach you base R before we write our first function instead of trying to teach you about all of this other um, Rlang non-standard evaluation stuff. But um, but yeah, that was the the main contents of this chapter. There are some further readings. Uh, the book, The Design of Everyday Things by Don Norman, that is kind of, that is more of a, uh, that is not a programming book. That is literally a book about how things are designed um, in the world, but it is pretty uh, interesting. Um, some of these things uh, follow the Zen of Python. So I also use Python and it's one of the things in there is just make it clear that there's only one good way of doing something. And that's sort of the mantra that Tidyverse follows. Um, and if you end up finding yourself writing like really weird Tidyverse things, um, go to the documentation and there probably is a function that does what you're trying to do already instead of, you know, trying to mangle like your data uh, oddly. Um, yeah. Questions. <laughs> yeah, thank you, Daniel. Uh, I usually, so I really like the pipe, but I don't always like how it, it's like 
noted as as the god of everything. <laughs> so I, I just uh, I was thinking about how long pipelines are good and maybe they can be too long or so you mentioned that you sketch something and in the end you will rewrite it as a long pipeline. And I actually I, I prefer to have some some logical steps. So maybe you have three to seven or 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 something functions where you have like a, a meaningful partial result. And 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 I was just wondering what what is your your approach about that or or how do you see that? Um, for one one other thing, I realized I actually didn't share my my screen like the way I intended. So like that that should fix. Oh man, this this audio this video recording is gonna be. I'm sorry, John. <laughs> <laughs> um, there was a blog post a couple of years ago that did something like. Um, like using the pipe is really annoying, especially for like doing something like calculating intermediates and like they, they had suggest something like, oh yeah, why don't you use like a variable that doesn't matter, like dot, right? Empty cars, like, and then they would write code like dplyr select empty cars, like mpg, and then that's your intermediate. And then you would say like, okay, the next uh, thing you want to do is filter. We can <laughs> Now oh, 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 sorry. Lots of sorry, 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 sorry. Oh, wait, wait, what, what do you have? Okay. Your whole desktop. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> Are things working now? Yeah, there you go. Okay, cool. Uh, let me take your, um, and so people had this, there was this blog post about like, okay, use this dot um, to, to save your intermediates. Um, I am opposed doing this because that's that's really hard to see. <laughs> um, and also uh, the dot ends up being used to place the object, not if you're piping, it's like the dot operator gets parsed to take yeah, the sure. thing that's being piping into the other. Yeah, so that, that that's like a whole bunch of other things. But your question was about like saving intermediates. Yeah, I guess not 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 every line, but maybe maybe you you read the data and did some initial cleaning, and then you can save it as I don't know clean data, and then you will do summarizing and do then you will do maybe visualizing. So I guess I'm just saying that yeah. So you mentioned, for example, debugging, and it it can be easier if you have some some stops in your pipeline not, not every line but but if there's a a meaningful result maybe so i it, it will always like um sort of like will always be like what makes sense to you um i guess i can show you maybe this is what what i've done maybe maybe do i have something like this yeah so um this is like my dissertation code. Uh, don't mind that I'm using source, but it's set up to use a package. So that that's my that's my rationale for this. Um, yeah, like it like there are going to be times instead of like just writing one giant pipeline, like I need to make sure that like things are being read properly. Um, so certain things are certain things are in pipelines and other things aren't. I guess the the thing that it's also like, it's always a, going to be a balance between if I put everything to a pipeline, that'll look good. Um, but the problem is if I need to like tease out intermediates, like now it becomes like this whole like, okay, now I have to break this pipeline in a whole bunch of places. Um, and so what what I do, like my style of programming is I'll pipelining, I'll pipeline things that are like, like thoughts, <laughs> like if this is like a one type of calculation I need, I'll pipeline that set of calculations, but that'll always start off with um, a variable um, instead of like reading in, instead of the raw one. Um, the other places that I build in, like where my pipelines break is like, if I need some, if I actually just need some intermediate in multiple places, like I will just make that a variable and just pipeline off of that. Um, and then this is like one script that like all it's doing is literally loading in um, Qualtrics data, stripping out all of the 
uh, GPS results, like Qualtrics, like automatically capture like your IP address, which is like not something I expected when I was putting the IRB together. Uh, and then literally just saving out the results because I never want to see that stuff. Uh, so, and then here you see I'm, I'm using walk because I have a bunch of um, CSV files and instead of using map because writing is a side effect function, I'm using walk. Um, but yeah, like in terms of the intermediates that get created, like it really, I, I am personally not a fan if you just send me like this whole like 20 line pipeline. I was like, there's no way that's going to run again. <laughs> it's sort of, it's sort of my like initial thought. And it's going to be like, all right, now I'm going to have to like figure out and like break this pipeline and like see where the break is. Like if something were to go wrong or if I want to, if my data updates and I need to recheck something, um, that is, that is how I've done things. Um, but if I need to send code to somebody like, Hey, this thing works for you. Like, yeah, I, I'll probably clean it up to the point where like, it's all pipelining, uh, one giant pipeline. Um, if it fits that format, but, um, yeah, I personally break things up, uh, because I like to look at my intermediates and most of the time those intermediates get used in other functions. Um, the other thing that I do is, um, part of my some sometimes the intermediate is going to be code that I'm going to use to plot. And so I will make sure I save that intermediate out to a file and then I will have a totally separate plotting script. So like I will, I will on purpose break my pipelines just so I can save out this intermediate and then do the analysis, do the stats in one script and then do the, um, the figure plotting in another script. Uh, and that's just, that's just a thing that I've slowly developed over time because if I need to fix a figure, I don't want to find where my plotting code is. I just know that that's the figure plotting script and I can open it. And so I've built my entire workflow around that. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, I got a question actually. Um, is data frame uh, ever preferred to uh, Tibble? Like it seems like Tibble is just like way better than data frames with all the features. So just wondering. Um, it, there are going to be times where if you try to pass in a data frame object, it'll not work. Um, I encountered this in tidy text where like if you have a data frame set up and you pass in tidy text functions like a data frame, it's not going to work. And I think that's because it's relying on some of the extra features that data frame has, uh, Tibble has over data frames. Uh, so in that sense, uh, data frames are not preferred. <laughs> um, the Tibble object really, if you are programming, if you, it, if you are programming for something like tibbles are nice because you are the outputs are more consistent especially like if they if the user sends you one column instead of two like you don't have to write checks on is this a data frame or is this a vector uh, so tibbles are better in that sense as a programming point of view because like its outputs are way more consistent um that's that's really the only I mean, I don't really know of a situation where like a data frame is preferred over a tibble. Um, some functions, again, will tell you a tibble is preferred because it won't work. <laughs> um, but yeah, for the most part, you should be able to pass in any data frame like object into the especially like some of the more core functions like select and filter, like you can pass in a data.table object. Um, it'll work because data.table is also a data frame. Uh, so if you, if you say like class of some, uh, say the class is something, it's a data frame, but if you say, I don't know, what is, what's, what's a library that has a, IDR, I think it has one. This, yeah. So if we say like class of this, like it's still a data frame object, it just 
is also a tibble on top, right? And you'll see this when you class the tidy model objects as well. Like it'll be some random, I, I think it's also built on top of a data frame, but then it'll just, or, or it'll be like a tidy model thing, but it, it's gonna be like stuff built on top. Uh, so that's how you sort of read, like, what is this thing fundamentally? Like, yeah, it's got all this other stuff, but fundamentally it's a data frame. So if you, that's why if you can, that's why you can do something like billboard and then you can say like, give me the first column. Is that, is that the right code? Is this the right code? Like one, one to 10. <laughs> you don't want that naked that colon. Work. Don't use the colon. Oh, 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 that. whoops. Okay, that that's that's a Python thing. Sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. Um, but yeah, the um that's why you can subset um like a regular data frame if if you need to. So it, it'll fall back to data frame features if it's not already implemented. So that doesn't really answer your question like what's better, but um for the most part, it shouldn't matter. Yeah, I've just been using data frame out of habits for a really long time. And then uh, advanced art chapter, I think three, literally just called me out on it. So I think I'm just gonna start using tibbles. Yeah, I, the, the other, I mean, the other thing with tibbles that are nice is like when you print it out, it literally gives you the data type underneath. So like, that's just a nice life hack, like quality of life thing. Like missings are colored in red when you print them out on the console, like that's also nice. Um, I have a love hate relationship with the fact that it cuts off like the columns, like depending on how wide your screen is, but it is nice that like, it's not going to flood and you don't get the whole, like I've met my 3000 character print limit. It's like, okay. Yeah. Most of the time you don't need any output to be 3000 lines and mean, and that's not useful at all. So, um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of, that's sort of like other nice things that tibbles that I like about tibbles, especially like the data type thing, because when you print it out, you see right away versus like, what is this problem? And then you end up classing and like you L apply a class to figure out like what the heck is this data type being stored. Uh, so things like that are quality of life things that hopefully helps you like debug your code if things are wrong. Like if this double comes in as a string, I can, I can see it right away. Like, okay, someone put a bad value in here. Um, and you know, you might not catch that immediately uh, if it was just a data frame.